Welcome to Spiritual Psychology, and I'm here with Jen Hudzik, who's an end-of-life educator and death doula, also an ancestral healing practitioner, and we're going to talk about one of my favorite topics, death and dying. Jen, welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Renee. So tell us what it means to be a death doula. Mm, Yes, that's a great question. So my sense is that it means something different to everybody because there are so many different roles to fill as an end of life doula or um, a death midwife. And so for me personally, it means showing up for somebody who is in the dying process as well as their family Mm -hmm. and showing up with a very deep level of presence, Mm -hmm. a non-judgmental, non-judgmental attitude, an open heart and an ability to be able to hold what the family is going through Mm -hmm. and in a way that is sensitive and in a way that can provide some guidance to the family. I also want to say that, um, end of life doulas don't just have a role at end of life. We actually have a role to play in people's lives when throughout life, actually, to, um, to really support people to engage with their own mortality in a way that is healthy and is well supported as well. So I love this topic because we have a very unhealthy relationship with death for the most part in our kind of over culture. And I have been my own form of death doula in in many circumstances and my own practice with Buddhist psychology and really being present with mortality I know can be really confronting for people. So how do you work to help people to accept or learn from the impermanence that we have here in our physical form? Yeah, yeah. So I think that you referenced it beautifully when you brought up Buddhism. And Mm -hmm. I am not particularly a Buddhist, but I have benefited from Buddhist philosophy throughout my whole life. Um, And I think that the concept and the practice of deep presence is what can help to bring us into the alignment with the fact that we are going to die. Mm -hmm. And of course, death has a lot of fear around it. There's fear of pain. There's fear of being separated from loved ones. There's Mm -hmm. fear of the unknown. And so I work with people to help highlight those things in their life that are very significant, that are really fulfilling, Mm -hmm. that bring meaning to their lives so that they can live in a rich, full way and appreciate those things and be deeply present with those things. Mm -hmm. And when we're deeply present in our lives, we can experience expand ourselves and our consciousness to being more present and befriending death and befriending the concept of our physical body not being with us and so I work with presence I work with awareness I work with people um, with where they're at so a lot of people I see have different religious beliefs They have, you know, they may be a spiritual person, but they may also subscribe to um, religious, you know, religious beliefs. And so Mm -hmm. I meet them where they at, where they're at. And also I use the language that they're using with me. So I try to reflect that back so that there is a level of comfort and there is a level of communication that really works for people. So I know for myself, in the spiritual psychology work that I do, <laughs> excuse me, um, we do a lot of really deep spiritual connecting and yeah. connecting with nature, connecting with source in whatever way people understand that. And again, in whatever their traditions are, um, people may connect with religious figures or ancestors. 
Um, but also nature spirits um, that I've come to work with through shamanism and many particularly of my end of life clients, whether they, they are, I haven't had anybody actively dying with me in a long time, but really find tremendous comfort in these transpersonal connections or metaphysical connections and this sense of continuity from a spiritual perspective that they kind of experience. I don't have any particular paradigm that I, certainly I don't try to teach anything to anybody. I just tell them what my experience is mm -hmm. and, and the experiences that I observe in other people. Um, I'm curious how religion and spirituality plays into your work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I consider myself an animist and mm -hmm. I've always been an animist since, you know, since the time I was a, a young child. Um, and as a, as a young adult, I translated that into neo shamanism mm -hmm. and the, um, this neo shamanistic movement, because that was how I was able to, um, that helped me define what it was that I was feeling as a young child and the relationships that I was having with the natural world as a young child. So my, my spirituality has been informed by my relationships with the natural world, with the, the world of the unseen, as well as the human world, of course. Um, but much like you, I, I also have forces and allies that exist within the spirit realm. And so when I lean into those relationships that I have, I'm able to translate how I relate into seeing how someone else may relate and mm -hmm. digging a little bit to find out what it is that they are believing in, what what relationships do they have? Because oftentimes people don't realize that they are in relationship with the spirit realm. And so I ask, you know, what trusted powers, what guides and allies do you connect with? You know, is it is it a pet that may be crossed over? Is there a particular mm -hmm. flower? Is there something that really speaks to you when they proclaim to not have relationships or when they they don't quite know where their spiritual compass is oriented. And so I open up the conversation through meditation mm -hmm. to help them be able to define what those relationships are. And in that way, they feel a level of support come through that can help them befriend death or can help them feel, like you said, that continuity of life and that larger web. And there are studies now that show that people who have a system in place of believing in what we might call the wider web or the universe, or they believe in that continuity of life in, in whatever way, shape or form works for them, that there is an ease that happens. There is a, a level of acceptance that happens when and if they're faced with a um, anticipated death mm -hmm. and so um so absolutely spirituality plays a huge role in um, supporting people on their death journey or supporting them to become comfortable with the idea of eventually having a death journey so just in case anybody doesn't know the term animism is the idea that everything holds consciousness or is animated by the life force. And yeah. certainly modern physics points to that when we talk about atomic physics and everything has atoms that are swirling around, whether we understand them or not. I think that's kind of a generally accepted idea. And animism for me has even expanded out into things that are non-living like realizing that this whole field that we live in in the third density of middle earth is made up of consciousness and so even you know I was so even inanimate things like rock 
or stone or even man-made things. Like they're all actually created and held together by this energetic life force or chi or whatever you want to call it. And I was, you know, very moved recently. I had a client who had an incredibly traumatic thing. He, he was born with a very severe birth defect. And they had to do multiple, very extensive surgeries on him under two years old. And at one point, he was strapped down, unable to move for, I believe it was two months as as a like around a year old. And he has some memories of that time and how excruciating that was for him. And he, there was a brick wall in the hospital where he was. His mother used to sit with him. And he actually was able to connect with the energy of the bricks. Mm. He like reached out through his, he was like so desperate for connection. And what's happened for him as an adult is that he really has this very tactile sense of the life force in all things. He can really feel it. And, and particularly for him, one of the uh, easiest accesses is plants. And mm -hmm. so he has a lot of house plants and he can actually just touch the plants. And we, we call it speaking plant. And mm -hmm. he can like feel the life energy of the plant. It's incredibly calming for him. And we talk a, a lot about the whole cycle of plant life, you know, absorbing the sun and the water and the nutrients to make these formations. That's a plant, right? And how the plant will return back into that. And that makes so much sense to him energetically as he thinks about his own death or his own movement of how this sense that everything is alive and everything is connected, even though it's impermanent has been yes. really, really comforting for him. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And that, that is the perfect segue into um, how do people get there, right? Like if they aren't feeling connected or they don't have a sense of, you know, trusted powers or those relationships with either animate, inanimate, carnate, incarnate, there is a, a growing movement of um, psilocybin therapy for mm -hmm. people who are facing death or who are wanting to get in touch with their mortality because using that plant medicine drops people into the experience of under, you know, supervision and with supportive uh, therapy, you know, therapists, but it drops them into that experience of actually feeling and sensing it because so many people are so up in their heads around like how do I connect that to have a physical sense and to have that experiential process around it can be so therapeutic and so helpful and pulling in that plant medicine for end of life um, finding end of life peace and end of life meaning is another piece of the end of life movement that is really taking root now yeah for people who can't access it um by if they aren't able to relax their conscious mind then the drugs can be really helpful to help them to do that um but i know it's not necessary to have psychedelics in order to have a spiritually connected experience because we are all connected all the time and my my work is to really try to make that as simple and non woo woo as possible because it really is simple for us. And really, if we just bring our awareness into our bodies and relax our conscious mind and just open to our more intuitive, non rational ways of knowing and gathering information, it's actually not complicated. I think the mind for a lot of us is so active and has ideas about things when we can kind of relax that though, then the connection is just right there. Yeah, absolutely. In, 
in whatever way it wants to make itself known to us. Mm-hmm. So what other ways do you help people to connect? Mm, yeah. So, so primarily what I do is when I meet with people and it's oftentimes over zoom. So, you know, time and space isn't a limitation. We discuss what their fears are. We discuss mm-hmm. what it is that they are envisioning for what a, a good death would look like, right? Mm-hmm. If, if they had their uh, druthers, what would that look like for them? And so mm-hmm. we really pick apart that vision or I ask them prompting questions to just go deeper. And then I bring them into like a guided meditation so that like you said, they can relax that mind state and they can really source from a place of being somatically, so like bodily connected Mm -hmm. and also connected to their heart and Mm -hmm. using their heart space as this inner GPS that can guide them towards what it is they are looking for or the connections that they are trying to make or what that vision is for how they want this final rite of passage to look and how the people around them can support that vision. Um, So there's a lot of questions. There is a lot of listening. There is presence and there is this dropped in guided meditative piece that I bring to the process of that inquiry. So you were talking earlier about meaning and helping people to connect with meaning in their life as as a point of acceptance or or meaning or peace and i know for myself that uh i think of one woman in particular that i worked with who had colon cancer and she had a niece that she loved very much she knew she wasn't going to be able to be there for the niece as she went through these different stages in her life. And so we spent quite a few hours making video for the niece at different stages of her life in the future of what she would say to her when she had her first boyfriend or when she graduated from college or high school. And it was really so comforting and grounding for her to have this sense of her own continuity after her passing in that she would be able to still, you know, offer her wisdom and love to her niece. And it was a really beautiful process to be a part of. Yes. Yes, absolutely. So yeah, yeah. That that's something that we would refer to as a legacy project. And in those, in those Um, creative spaces like the video or an audio or pulling together a scrapbook. I mean, like sky's the limit when we talk about legacy projects, but it's in those places of dropping into that, uh, into the creative self that we can explore the meaning in one's life. And, um, you know, we have, we have such this societal pressure to have a meaningful life in a really big way you know what does that look like what is your what is your purpose on this planet and it's so huge and overwhelming and pressurized that when we engage in that process of legacy work and we make that inquiry we're sort of like taking a peek into the nooks and crannies of what was meaningful to you was was it meaningful when you made that person laugh was it meaningful when you placed that present, you know, in that special place or, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. So we really break down the, um, this, this, this gigantic idea of what meaning is. And I think that's beautiful. What you, you know, what you're able to support with this person and to create these audios and, um, to ask those questions and to have those moments where that person could reflect back on their life to find those nooks and crannies of meaning. I'm wondering about making peace. Mm. Like how do people make peace before they 
calves or what's your experience with that? Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, yeah, I think it looks different for everyone. And I think that we equate oftentimes being at peace with also forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And so if one is at peace, then there is this idea that there has been forgiveness and reconciliation and, you know, they've made amends or, you know, things, you know, they've smoothed things over perhaps with family members or friends or, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. to be in a place of peace and contentedness. And to that, I would say from my observation and my experience that being in a state of peace at the time of one's death connects us to what we have been grateful for. Mm -hmm. And so looking at those things, what have we really been grateful for? What is what has our life been blessed with? Mm -hmm. And and finding those moments despite dysfunction, despite drama, you know, all of this and 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 looking very deeply to find those places of acknowledgement and gratitude. And if forgiveness happens naturally as a process of being in that place of gratitude, then beautiful. And if it doesn't, that's not something that I force. You know, you mm -hmm. can be at peace and not be in a place of forgiveness. You can be in a peace, you can be in a place of peace and 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 the two and forgiveness they don't equate you know one right. they're they're not you know mutually um they're not symbiotic you don't have to have one to have the other some people experience both some would say that you have to have one to have the other but I really believe that having that reflective capacity of what's blessed your life what you have done how you may have changed the lives around you that is something that can really help to settle people into a place of peace and acceptance. And so how can we help people accept death as a natural phase of life? It's one of the things that I find, um, well, I don't know what the word is, but I find it, <laughs> um, that there is always a sense that death is a tragedy and that it shouldn't yeah. be happening. And, yeah. you know, it was really interesting because I did a three week retreat with the Zen Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh, who also mm -hmm. recently passed. And we did a lot of contemplations about impermanence as one of the tenets of Buddhism. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that he was talking about was um, imagine all of the things that our body creates and if those things were permanent, if they didn't change form. So imagine all, like if you were sitting upon all of the defecation that you ever made in your life, upon all the hair that ever fell out of your body, for all the skin that ever sloughed off, all the clothes that you don't wear anymore, all that. And, and it was really interesting to think about like how healthy the kind of transformation of physical things is like, it's necessary. What if, I mean, he was like, what if no one ever died? How crowded would the world be? And what would the quality of it be? So it's a really interesting, um, I mean, I have spent a lot of time considering death. And so, and I, I actually consider it one of the greatest teachers that we have because it gives everything meaning. If we lived forever and ever, and I had forever and ever, I don't know if I would feel motivated to do a lot of things that I do or make sure that the people I care about know that I care about them if they were just going to be taken for granted and not have uh, the gift of impermanence. And so I'm, I'm just curious what you think about that. Yeah, yeah. So to go back to your original question, which was... Um, um, 
how do we like basically like how do we befriend that right mm -hmm. like how do we how do we get to that place and absolutely you know the the uh, holding the seed that everything changes that there is impermanence mm -hmm. and holding that every single day is that practice of starting to build a relationship with death and death is hard. I mean, it is brutal. It, 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 you know, children and suicide and overdose and all the ways that death sweeps into our life and changes us and, and, um, catalyzes a grief process that mm -hmm. can last a lifetime. It is, it is hard and sitting with that discomfort of how difficult it can be, how we've experienced it in our lives for the good and the bad, you know, like the, the deaths that are tragic and are, are, are just rip us apart and the anticipated deaths that are um, just a more gentle and yet not at, you know, still difficult to go through with, you know, an, an elderly parent, but sitting with the seed that we are going to die. It is part of our process. We are born and we die and life is what happens in between. And when we can really take that in and make that part of our habit, some people, you know, there's a huge fear like, oh, if I think about it, if I talk about it, if I, if I explore that space of death, I'm going to bring it to me. And, and what I would say to that is you are building a relationship with something that is inevitable. And so take the time now to build that relationship with it and to go through those motions of the sadness of, mm -hmm. of, of not physically being with loved ones, of leaving things behind and go through the acceptance process of the impermanence that you've spoken so eloquently to. And it's like anything, you know, when we become, when we have a practice with it, then we become more comfortable with it. And we're able to explore it in a way that discharges some of the fear and some of the emotion around it. And it reorients us to a place of how can I be creative with this? How can I show up for others and be in a place of presence and awareness and deep compassion? And so it really begins to shift us when we make it part of our practice. It's like brushing our teeth. It's like, you know, it's like cooking ourselves a meal or, you know, whatever. And so I say, make it a habit, even if it's just 30 seconds a day. If this was my last day to live, or if tomorrow I knew I was going to die, how would I live today? And that, you know, that is also, um, you know, uh, Buddhist philosophy as well. And, um, and so that, that's something that I have in my own life found to be very helpful when, when working in this realm. Yeah, I definitely, I don't know when I started to do it, but have spent some time. It just crosses my mind because it's a very per pregnant and potent and present part of my life that I'm aware of how much time maybe I have left, right? And it, what it's done is it's really put a fire onto my butt to do things that I really want to do. And to think about how I feel at the end of my life. How do I want to feel like you were talking about the death people want to have? And um, and how do we intention that and kind of plan toward that as part of our life plan? You know, there are some traditions that will say that the moment of your death is perhaps the most important moment of your life because it determines what your next lifetime will be. And um and so, you know, I figure I have somewhere between 
20 and 35 years left. And there's a lot of stuff I want to do. And um, I need to get moving on that now if I think that stuff is going to happen so that I don't have regrets at the end. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and having that fire under you and the relationships that you've built, the belief system that you subscribe to and the values, however death comes to one, you know, if, if it's through disease or illness or whatnot, it is the practice of making it a part of your life on a daily basis. It, it builds our faculties and it resources us so that when, or if that type of process happens in our lives, we are better equipped to orient towards how that lands with us, you know, how it might be to go through, uh, you know, cancer treatments or have to go into a place, um, hospice or, you know, whatnot, have some assisted care. Like we're much better resourced. You know, I think about a good friend of mine who was present at the death of her grandmother and she was really frightened by death. You know, a lot of the depictions of death in our culture are murder and violent death. You know, it's all over TV. I mean, that's what a lot of TV shows are about, right? Murder mysteries or crime. And there's actually very few deaths happen that way compared to the, the more natural kind or whatever that means. But, um, and so we've been separated from the dying and the death process. It's become a medicalized thing that professionals take care of in some kind of a sterile setting. And her grandma wanted to die at home. And so mm -hmm. the girls were there with her and that whole process was so healing for her. I remember, so she was actually in the room when her grandma passed and then they did a very traditional thing, which is that they undressed her and they cleaned her body and they put some nice clothes on her and they fixed her hair and they just got to sit with her dead body. Mm -hmm. And you know, even saying that, I'm sure there's people that will think like, that's creepy, but it wasn't. It's this very natural thing that has always been part of humanity until pretty recently, actually. And it was so healing for my friend. And she said, I can't believe how peaceful it was. Yeah. And even, the, I mean, for her grandmother, it, it luckily had a peaceful death because not all of them are, but um how healing death can be when we're with it and yeah. how many people actually have some of their first real visceral spiritual experiences around the death of a loved one who they care about where all of a sudden they'll start to be signs and symbols or butterflies appear everywhere or you know whatever their favorite number was shows up on the clock and on the phone and on the you know, it's a, um, there's a very mystical aspect of death when we can settle our fear and be present um, with even the beauty of it, Yeah, in my experience. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It is, it, it is, um, it is something that I'm hoping our culture will return to, is bringing our dead home. Mm. And being able to have them, you know, in a home or someone else's home or, you know, have that experience of normalizing it. And in that place of normalizing it, there is this beauty. There is such an incredible beauty to be in a space mm. where somebody is closer to God or the universe or whatever it is that they believe in when that place is when that person is in that place of crossing the threshold it is sacred and it is divine and it is beautiful and we can make it such an incredible rite of passage and 
that's where the education comes into play. Like people don't realize you can die at home. Your body can stay at home for a number of days. Mm -hmm. The family can actually deliver, not like drive, but like the family can be at a crematorium and, you know, witness the body going into the flames. Mm -hmm. So we can have living funerals, we can have green burials. So there's all of this return to what was uh, co-opted, you know, and in the, in around the time of the civil war, that's sort of where we started to make a transition into more of an institutionalized death, um, like culture. Do you know about that history? I'm curious about that. I do. I do. So I, I learned recently that, um, that during the civil war, people, families were wanting to bring their young men home Mm -hmm. and, and to be able to do death rites at home, because that was, you know, and I'm speaking just, you know, specifically about the United States, but right. um, they wanted to be able to have those death rites at home. That's how it always was. Mm-hmm. And, um, and with the advent of embalming, the soldiers, some of the soldiers were able to be embalmed and then transported, you know, over thousands of miles so mm-hmm. that their families could then do the death rites with them. And there were, you know, the medical community were the ones responsible for embalming. And so more and more people turned to embalming, including President Lincoln. He was actually embalmed because of his experience seeing the bodies of the young men coming home from the Civil mm-hmm. War. And, and so this whole, you know, this whole culture built up around embalming and moving death out of the home and into funeral homes and you know, so on and so forth. And so, you know, absolutely like funeral homes and morticians have their place. That's and right. Cause they carted Lincoln's body around the country, didn't they? They did. They did. Um, um They did a, a small, they did a, a loop, but yeah. So, yeah. And so it was his wife actually that said, I want the people to be able to have a goodbye. And with this new technology at the time, um, people were able to have that experience with him. They have a glass casket for him. I'm not. I can't say for sure. I'm, you I'm, know, I can't hear that. I'm not sure that's true. So, yeah, I can't. I can't be quoted on that. But I think I was just. You know, I've moved to New York, and I was just uh, listening to some history of New York, and it was, and there he was paraded down. Um, and I think I heard that there was some kind of a glass carriage so that people could see him as they paraded by interesting yeah and then that just became kind of the fashion i would imagine and then we moved into funeral homes yeah yeah interesting yeah so yeah so this return to bringing our bringing our dead home and and um reinstating you know death rights so that's sort of where that breach happened and to take that I think removes a lot of the fear mm-hmm. of the unknown to yeah. actually have to be present. And I, I'm very grateful that I've had the opportunity to be present at many deaths. And, yeah. Um, and they're all different. And the experiences that happen are quite different. Um, I remember particularly... So I wasn't physically present, but I was asked to do some spiritual work through my spiritual psychology work. Um, I, if people ask me to, can track the dead as best I can using some shamanic journey work. And so there was a little boy who had cancer and he was going to pass and the whole family was there. And um, so they asked me, you know, it was right after he died and and they called and said, you know, what's happening? And I saw that um, there were two, I would call them sort of semi-angelic beings. They were light beings with him. And there was one on each side holding his hand. And I saw them walk through an open doorway filled with light that had many other light beings on the other side. 
And uh, the boy looked quite happy and, and he was certainly comfortable with these two beings. Yeah. So I, I just shared what I had observed um, in my inner journey. And she shared it in the room with the family that was there. And one of the, it was probably an aunt, she said, when Brady died, I saw two balls of light come to him. Mm -hmm. and they, she saw it in a different way, but she saw the same thing I did. And um, for those who weren't, you know, don't have that kind of sight, it was, it was really comforting for the family to, I mean, I don't make meaning out of those things necessarily. I just know what I've observed very frequently is that there is a lot of help on the other side to help people mm -hmm. transition. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. For, for me, connecting people with that's a lot of my work is helping people to connect with those, you know, allies or helpers in whatever way that they understand it um, or whatever way it comes to them. Because I think the fear is the sense of disconnection. Mm -hmm. yeah. And from my observation, death can actually be very connecting. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, there is such there there is a there is a there's a very legitimate fear that when we die we are alone. Yeah. And you know, being alone is one of the deepest fears that we hold as humanity. Yeah. And so um yeah, whatever it is that people are connecting to, you know, they often say like am I going to see my loved ones? Will I be with my loved ones and you know, and my response is, do you believe that you'll be received by your loved ones? Because I, you know, in my role, I try not to lead people, you know, mm -hmm. in my personal life, I do ancestral work. And so mm -hmm. I work, I work in that realm all the time, day mm -hmm. in and day out. But my, you know, my role as an end of life doula is to ask those questions so that they can, you know, have that, that, that moment of, Oh, I do. I do actually believe that I will be with my husband or my parent or my grandparent or, you know, whoever, mm -hmm. my pet. That's another, you know, that's mm -hmm. a really important to people. Yeah. Um, so yeah, absolutely that um the continuity and that understanding that we won't be alone and that there can be incredible connection. And I think that a lot of people they long for that their whole mm -hmm. life without knowing, you know, they're longing for that connection and, um, you know, to be with the source or to be back with their people in some way. And um, so there is one thing I wanted to speak to as well, though, because you brought up this, this young boy um, that you worked with. And so the piece that I wanted to just name is normalizing death for the, for our children and mm -hmm. for the next generation and how, deeply important it is to um you know in in the in the best way possible to um expose our children to the natural cycle of birth and death mm -hmm. and um you know i remember when i saw my first birth as a uh, as a birth doula and i thought oh my gosh if everyone could see a baby being born, how it would change our culture and our world. And I feel the same way about death. And so, um, and so really normalizing that for our younger generations is, is deeply important and being a steward or being the person in the family or the person in the community to help create those healthy associations is where the tide I think will turn. And so what can we offer people at home to make more peace with death or to help someone they might work with who's dying mm. in their yeah. process? Yeah. So I'll go to the second piece first, um, mm -hmm. which is, you know, how can we be supportive and available? to someone or to, you know, a friend who's supporting someone. And I really think that the biggest gift we can give is our presence. 
Mm. Just being present and being an active listener without relating to their story and taking it from them by saying, oh yeah, when my mom died, you know, or when my so-and-so, like being absolutely neutral and present and being heart-centered and just listening. Mm. And that is where I think we can really be the biggest support because Mm. a lot of people withdraw. They don't know what to say and they withdraw, but being present with somebody you don't have to actually say anything and it's many times it's better not to but to just be there and to be there with your eyes and with your heart Mm -hmm. um so that's you know that's what I say to that that's my that's my sense about that Mm -hmm. um and then your what was your first question now I've lost it (laughs) the first question is how can can we offer anything to people at home to make peace with their own death Yes. Thank you. Yeah. So again, I go back to that seed and it's so simple, but to ask oneself on a daily basis, if I had one day, one week, one month to live, how would I live? Mm -hmm. And so that brings into play this, this beautiful paradox of like, how do I want to live before I die? And it, gets people thinking about death in a way that is reoriented towards living well and Mm -hmm. living fully. And, Mm -hmm. and it's a gentle way of working death into our daily life. It's just asking that question. I mean, there's lots of beautiful books that people could resource that they could get. Um, but but truly, I think it just comes down to that one reflective question a day and mm-hmm. asking it over and making a practice of it. And that will bring our nervous system, I think, down into a state of uh, more calmness and more centeredness when it comes to um, befriending death. Or not, if you're not living in your or own not. integrity and it may... I can put a fire oh. under your butt. To, I know it It has certainly changed things for me, that mm-hmm. practice of uh, live as if your life depended on it. Yeah. It does. Right? Yeah. This is not a dress rehearsal. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Absolutely. And, you know, it, and, and, and people who fear death, they know they fear death. I mean, it can really, it can really overshadow Mm -hmm. your life. And so, you know, moving into that space is, is, um, is really an act of of self-love. It's, it's, it's self-care. And, um, and that's really what I hope and want for people is to be able to dissipate some of that charge around it so that they can really find more peace, more awareness and more excitement about the life that they've been given. Mm. Yeah. You know, um, I think I'll close with uh, this wonderful story from another friend present at her mother's death. And Mum's last words were, oh, it's beautiful. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Right. Like that, what a gift to the family mm. to leave them with that. Yeah, absolutely. So, Jen, it's been wonderful to talk to you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much for this conversation. It's been really, it's been really in depth and fun. And I appreciate all of your sharing as well and your wonderful questions. And so how can people get in touch with you? Yeah. So I have a website. It's jenhudzik.com. My last name is H-U-D-Z-I-E-C, which is not. That'll be in the show notes. (laughs) Thank you. Um, So yeah, everything that I offer, um, you can contact me through my website, the events and classes that I have are on there, um, and all the services that I offer around death and dying and ancestral ancestral healing and um, the other ritual work that I do is all on my website. 
Beautiful. And if you want to get in touch with me, Renee McKenna, and all my information is down in the show notes as well. Jen, so great to talk to you. Blessings on the beautiful work that you're doing. Thank you so much, Renee. Thank you so much for having me. And likewise, thank you for the good work you're doing.